السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم in the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى the most gracious the most merciful الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين we praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى we send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم his household his companions may Allah bless every one of us May Allah bless the Ummah and may Allah bless humanity at large. I mean, my brothers and sisters, we are speaking about the 10 who were given news of paradise by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam in one gathering. So there were many who were told by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam that they would be from among those in heaven, in Jannah, actually in paradise. And from among them, 10 were in one gathering. And I will be speaking to you about the youngest, the one who passed away the last of the ten. His name was Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiyallahu anhu. But he was an uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, even though he was 23 to 25 years younger. I'm sure it happens in some cases where you find people are much younger and they say, that's my uncle, that's my aunt, <laughs> that's my grandmother, subhanallah. Uh, technically, because he was the second cousin of the mother of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he was known as an uncle and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam loved him. So much so that he used to say, who from among you can show me that they have an uncle as good as mine? And he would point at Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu was a lovely person. He had great character and conduct. And what is amazing is when he accepted Islam, it was through a miracle. Many of us, we go to sleep, subhanallah, we see a dream and we get up and it starts worrying us. And sometimes we take the dreams too seriously. You know, a dream is normally connected to your thoughts and your worries. A lot of the dreams, most of them don't have a meaning. It's just your worries, your thoughts, the ideas you have, something you might have seen without you really noticing that your brain and your system has already registered that. But sometimes we have a dream that bothers us and it repeats itself. And sometimes you have a dream and you start seeing things that you saw in your dream. And subhanallah, if it does have meaning, it's for you and your benefit. People see dreams and they start thinking that we need to change the whole world. Hang on. You need to change yourself first. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu, he had some good friends, even though they were older than him. And I said yesterday in Birmingham, and I'm repeating it here, my brothers and sisters, the biggest favor you could do yourself is to improve the quality of friends you have. Biggest favor. If you have a circle of friends who have high standards, good morals and values, and they're concerned about pleasing the Almighty, they're concerned about the hereafter, you will be a beautiful person. If they speak well, they stay away from vulgar language, they have good habits, you will develop those habits without an effort. And if they have bad habits, you will develop the bad habits. So this is something very important. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about it even in the Quran. وَيَوْمَ يَعَضُّ الظَّالِمُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِ اتَّخَذْتُ مَعَ الرَّسُولِ سَبِيلًا يَا وَيْلَتَا يَا وَيْلَتَا لَيْتَنِي لَمْ أَتَّخِذْ فُلَانًا خَلِيلًا On the day of judgment, the one who did wrong, the wrongdoer, will actually be chewing his hands, which means he will be regretting so much. And he will say, or she will say, I wish that I had chosen the path of the messenger. And I wish that I didn't have such and such a person as a friend of mine, because that person led me astray. What does this mean? This means in our lives, we have people who either show us the right path or the wrong path. And if we make them friends, they have an impact upon us. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu was friends with Abu Bakr as siddiq radiallahu anhu, even though he was 20 years or slightly more older than him. But they were friends. He got along with them. He was concerned. He, had, he was a friend of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. Beautiful. He was a friend of Zayd ibn Haritha. Zayd ibn Haritha was a slave before he was freed by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Khadija bint Khuwaylid radiallahu anha. So 
he saw a dream, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. In the dream, he was in the darkness, drowning in darkness, a lot of darkness. And suddenly he saw the moon in his dream. And you know, when you have a dark night, we come from Africa, we know perhaps a little bit more than you about the darkness of the night because of the electricity problems that we face, mashallah. So the dark night, the moon, the moonlight brings a lot, a lot of light. You will be surprised as to how much it brings. It lights your path. He saw the moon and there were people seated around the moon. Subhanallah. Who were they? He saw Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu seated at the moon. He saw Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu seated at the moon. He saw Zayd ibn Haritha seated at the moon radiallahu anhum. And he was amazed, he was impressed, and he wanted to go and sit with them. He got up from his sleep, subhanallah. He, his dream came to an end, and he decided this is not an ordinary dream. Let me go and fi find out. In the meantime, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu was also concerned about speaking to his friends about Islam. Speaking to his friends about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was such a great man, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, that when the goodness came to him, he accepted it, but he wanted it for everyone else. So he started reminding his best buddies and friends. He says, you know what? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is definitely a Nabi of Allah. He's a prophet of Allah. Why don't you accept this message? Look at what he is saying. He is not calling towards himself. Rather, he is calling towards the maker alone. He's calling towards the maker alone. Subhanallah. And he's asking us to give up bad habits and, and bad morals and values and calling us to worship Allah. Subhanallah. So they started accepting one by one. Six people had accepted Islam. How many? Six in total. Not yet many. You had Khadija binti Khawailid radiallahu anha and the, the three names I mentioned and two others. Subhanallah. Six people had accepted Islam. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu, as he's approaching Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, this man starts telling him, you know what? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's come with goodness and we have accepted Islam myself and this person and this person. And he started mentioning the names and Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu is saying, you know what? I saw a dream and he knew immediately the meaning of the dream is that I need to also join these people. The moon depicted Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Those who were seated around were real men whom he knew. So he says, take me to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was seated. He spoke to a few of these men, subhanallah, and they accepted Islam. So that was the story of how he became a Muslim. He saw it in a dream. Many of us see the dreams, right? Sometimes Allah sends us a message through that dream to change our ways and habits. Sometimes it's a reminder for us, but we don't realize. My brothers and sisters, if a dream that you've had, even if it was a nightmare, if it has not made you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then there's no point in relating it or getting excited about it or becoming sad about it. Sometimes we become sad about a dream. For what? If it was not going to change you, why sad? That sadness should draw you closer to Allah. This is why when you see a nightmare, you're supposed to seek the protection from the devil. You're supposed to turn the other side. Perhaps subhanallah, the sunnah has taught us even to give a charity. If you could, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So he was the seventh person who accepted Islam. And I explained to you how Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu was connected to it and how the dream was also a part of that. Now, when he declared his Islam, guess what happened? And it happens to a lot of those who revert to Islam. His mother, who was very, very close to him, decided, no way, no, no. We've heard some bad story about Muhammad, peace be upon him. I will never accept this. Impossible. And you know what? In order to make sure that he leaves Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because she didn't have much knowledge. She did not have knowledge about Islam. She only heard, you know, what was being said by some of the people in Quraysh, which was all negative. So she says, I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to drink until you quit trying to blackmail him and so what happened he said oh my mom you know what you don't eat you don't drink it's your loss i'm not quitting i know this is right 
I know what we used to do and what we're doing now. I've become a much better person, purified myself, no bad habits. I worship my maker alone and I'm getting closer to my maker, not even to this man, Muhammad, peace be upon him. I don't render acts of worship, but rather they are for Allah alone. The mother says, I'm not eating or drinking. And a few days later, she was literally on her deathbed. So the son says, you know, my mother, even if you were to die a hundred times, you would only harm yourself. I'm going nowhere. You're not going to stop me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses connected to the story of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu with his mom. The kindness to your parents and the goodness to your parents is a duty, even if they are not Muslim. The only time that you will disobey their instruction is when they order you to do something wrong, to do something that will be a transgression, to do something against the command of Allah. That is when you excuse yourself from that particular command, but you keep on being kind to them in every other way. So respect to your parents and kindness to your parents is absolutely an instruction of Allah. And here the verse came down at the time, right at the beginning in Makkah al Mukarramah of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu with his mother. And he used to say this verse was revealed because of me, subhanallah. So the lesson we learn is our parents are very important, no matter what. We respect them, we are kind to them. Yes, I do know some people say, what happens if my father molested me? Astaghfirullah. In that particular case, things change. You have to protect yourself. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us responsible people. You have to protect yourself. In that particular case, you may want to distance yourself depending on what happened. So Islam does not teach us that if you have been abused or molested, etc., that you need to keep on maintaining a relationship, even if it was your own father or a relative. I'm just making that clear because unfortunately it's on the rise, very sadly. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all protection. I mean. So the respect of parents, inshallah, extremely important. We all need to learn. The reason why we need to learn is this man was told you are from paradise. We are looking at his life in order for us to adopt what he had so that we can also, inshallah, be from among those who will earn Jannatul Firdaus and inshallah will be gathered in paradise. Then later on, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made a hijrah to Medina Munawwara. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu was also from among them who made hijrah to Medina Munawwara because of time. I'm not going to go into all those details, but something very interesting. He participated in the battles, in the battles with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said a prayer for him. He said a dua for him on the day of Uhud. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Allahumma saddid ramyata wa ajib da'wata. O oh Allah, straighten his arrow and answer his supplications. Straighten his arrows and answer his supplications. Now, the reason why I mention this is because both things happened. Whenever he took aim, he always got the target without a single failure through his life. It was the dua, the supplication of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Secondly, anytime he supplicated unto Allah, it was accepted. Subhanallah. He was known as Mustajabu Dawa, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu. He was known as the one whom, when he called out to Allah, it was granted. And this shows us that there are people from amongst us, perhaps whom, whenever they call out to Allah, Allah gives it to them. But they don't call out to Allah for silly things. You know, imagine if I was Mustajabu Dawa or you, what would we say? You have a problem with someone, Allah, fix him up. <laughs> you know, you have a problem. I think a lot of the in-laws wouldn't even exist. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. And some people, even their parents, they would say, oh Allah, take them away. And they, they would be gone. <laughs> That's why Allah doesn't give it to us. Because sometimes we abuse the issue of supplication. When you call out to Allah, use good words. You know, we have people who don't like Islam at all. People who've harmed Islam, for example, rather than say, oh Allah, destroy them. Don't you think it is more godly and it is more befitting for a believer to say, oh Allah, guide them, soften their hearts, let them come through. That's what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did. They were enemies of Islam, such as Umar ibn Khattab, anhu, before he reverted and uh, uh, 
who was the other man? Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl was known as Amr ibn Hisham. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Allahumma a'izz al-Islam bi ahad al-Umarain. Oh Allah, these two enemies give strength to Islam by letting them see the light and coming into the fold. Subhanallah, moments later, you find the story of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. We will hear it today, inshallah. And he came through and he declared his shahada. How many of us are prepared to try this blessed prayer for those who don't like us to say, Oh Allah, soften their hearts. Oh Allah, bring them forth. Oh Allah, uh, you know, resolve this matter between us, soften the hearts. Rather, we have a problem where when you have a little issue with someone, we say, Oh Allah, destroy them. Oh Allah, break them. Oh Allah, finish them up. Oh Allah. And what's happening? We are praying that against them and they are praying that against us. Hence, we see the destruction we're in today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us guidance. It's a very beautiful point. If you actually think about it, use your supplication in a good way. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam actually made this prayer for Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu an. It's reported that only once did he use it in what we would term perhaps a way that caused a little bit of uh, negativity, perhaps negativity in one way and positivity in another. At the time of the dispute between Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anh and Talha ibn Ubaidillah, Zubair ibn Awam and some of the others, there was a man who kept blowing into this fitna, into this problem, trying to make it big. So Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu, he was always pure in his heart. And he says to this man, don't do this. It's dangerous. What you're doing is you're causing a fitna between people. Listen carefully. You're causing a problem between people. How many of us do that? We love it sometimes. We just hear something. We go and say it to this one, say it to that one. And when the two fight, we say, yes, yes, yes. That's it, you know. It's good because we don't like both of them sometimes. May Allah forgive us. That's sometimes become our nature. No, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu went to this man and said, you know what? Stop it. It's not supposed to be this way. You're, you're not supposed to be creating a problem or making a problem bigger. If you want, you resolve it. Never ever address a matter in a way that makes it bigger. If it was a problem, the man refused. So Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu raised his hands and they say the people around him knew that this man, whatever he says, is done. He says, Oh Allah, stop him in whatever way you wish. Now that's not a negative dua. A few days later, the man passed away. Allahu Akbar. Or it's reported, it's one narration, same day, he was attacked by an animal and he went. Now, his death was written, but the people say, look, don't miss. Subhanallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. May Allah make us from among those whom whenever we call out supplication that is truly beneficial, may he accept it. And if it is detrimental for us, may it not be accepted. Sometimes we make a dua for something detrimental. You know, a person comes to me sometimes say, pray that Allah fulfills my dreams. And I says, what's your dreams? I mean, you might do, your dream might be to go and commit a big, big act that is totally unacceptable. And where am I going to say, oh Allah, let him fulfill his dreams. I'm not that way. Or you might want to pinch, you might want to steal, you might want to just plan a big robbery and you, you, you're making me say, Oh Allah, help him. I mean, come on. So it's important for us to know that when you ask Allah, you must say, Oh Allah, if it is beneficial for me, if it is helpful, grant me. Sometimes you desperately want to get married to someone and it doesn't happen. It's better for you. Perhaps Allah knows that the future holds something for you that would be otherwise had you married this person because Allah knows what would happen even if, you know, it's amazing how the knowledge of Allah works. Let me quickly mention it. He knows what has happened in the past. He knows what is happening and he knows what will happen. But more impressive than all of that is he knows what will not happen. If it were to happen, how it would have happened. He knows that subhanallah. So Allah knows had you been married to this person, then this is what would have happened. But because you didn't, so that did not happen. So Allah will protect you from it. And this is in Surah Al-Kahf. When Allah speaks about the story of Musa alayhi salam with Al-Khidr, certain things happened. And then Al-Khidr explains to Musa alayhi salam that the reason why this happened is because I was told by Allah, had I left the situation, it would have been even worse. So in this way, what I'm saying is, 
We call out to Allah, Oh Allah, can I have this and can I have that in particular? And then we blame Allah for not making it happen when Allah was doing you a favor by blocking it because He knew that in the future this would have been dangerous and detrimental for you. So therefore, thank Allah. Thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah make things easy for us. Let's move on. You know, there was something known as the farewell pilgrimage, Hajjatul Wada. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had gone for the pilgrimage. It was the only pilgrimage he had done. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu fell ill during the time of Hajjatul Wada. And you know, something amazing about the Muhajireen, a lot of them were quite wealthy. From among them, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu was a wealthy man. And he only at that time, he was still quite young. Still quite young. He only had one daughter. He only had a daughter. So he says, Oh messenger, peace be upon him. As you can see, I'm on my deathbed. Very interesting. I'm on my deathbed. And I only have one daughter and I've got so much money, so much wealth. What is she going to do with it? Can I give it to charity because she's already wealthy? He must have done whatever for her. He says, can I give it all for charity? He says, no, don't give it all for charity. So, so then he says, well, can I give three quarter of it away? He says, no. Well, then can I give half of it away? The Prophet, peace be upon him, says, thuluthu, wa thuluthu kathir. Give only a third away in charity. And that is more than enough. Then he continues to explain. He says, Innaka, If you were to leave your dependents wealthy, it is better for you than leaving them poor in a way that they will go around begging from people yet you were wealthy. You know what this means? So many things. Number one, charity begins at home. Subhanallah. You're a wealthy person. Well, make sure that your kids and make sure your family members, your relatives are all okay because you have wealth. What's the point of giving the whole world and your family is poor? People do that. One small misunderstanding, that's it, I'm not giving. No, there are examples in the life of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu where the verses were revealed to say you should not do that. If you're a person of honor, when you have a dispute with someone that should not stop you from donating in a charitable cause. Why? Because you were doing it for Allah, not for them. But when you give for them, you will stop giving. If I'm giving you for you, the day I have a problem with you, I stop giving you. But if I'm giving you for Allah, the day I have a problem with you, I continue because I was always doing it for Allah anyway. It's something very interesting. So this man, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu, he then decided that he's writing up a will, one third for my daughter, uh, one third for charity, the rest will go to my daughter, subhanallah. The rest will go to my daughter because of the instruction of the Prophet sallallahu But guess what happened? He did not pass away. He lived on. He lived on so long after that, that he was the last to pass away from the 10 who we are talking about that were given paradise. And he was one of the last from among the Muhajireen to pass away. He was 80 years old when he passed away. And he was 23 years younger than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or 25, according to the two dates we have. So you can imagine how long he lived, mashallah. And yet there was a time when he was very young, when he thought he's really going. How it happens to us, doesn't it? With us, the sad reality is you just have a little cough. I'm going, I'm going, that's it. Make peace with everyone. It's good because at least you start making peace. But the problem is as soon as you get better, you say, no, that peace was only connected to the fact that I thought I was going to die. We're back at war. <laughs> May Allah forgive us. We need to make sure that we make amends. You don't know when you're going to go, nor do I. How many times medicine or doctors have told us that, you know what, 24 hours remaining, 48 hours remaining, and they've lived on 48 years, 24 years thereafter. It has happened. I'm sure we have living examples in our midst of that. So it goes to show, just like Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu, never underestimate the mercy of Allah. Allah can keep you alive, but you need to keep doing good. And at the same time, make sure that we've learned a lesson when it comes to inheritance. Make sure that we learn a lesson. Let's be concerned about the well-being of our daughters, of our daughters. Many people culturally, we tend to look after our sons and we forget our daughters. Or we say, when I die, my daughter's okay. She's married. She's gone. When she was married, I gave her some gold and a bracelet. So that's fine. But you guys, this is the wealth we have. That is wrong. 
from an Islamic perspective, it is actually prohibited. You have to take care of your daughters. You have to make sure that even if it is a token, even if you think they don't need it, wallahi, you have to give it to them. You have to make sure. And brothers or those who remain behind, make sure you don't cheat your sisters. I know of cases where they undervalue property just to make the, the, the daughter happy. You know, a property worth five million pounds, for example, and the brother says 500,000 pounds. And the, 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 the sister says, wow, 500,000. Wow, alhamdulillah. She doesn't know 4.5 million is usurped. She doesn't even know that because the figure is too big. Let's be honest for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu used to cry a lot and he was very soft. He used to cry a lot. He was very soft. One day the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was seated with some of his companions and he said, if you want to see a man from Jannah, he's the next man entering. This happened a few times in the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. One of them, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu walked in. Subhanallah. And so Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu, he was very young. He decided, I'm going to go and find out what's this man all about. How come he's from paradise? I also want to be from paradise. So he went and he asks him, he says, you know what? This is what the Prophet, peace be upon him, said just before you walked in. So I want to know what's your deed. He says, I don't really have so many extra deeds. I'm just a normal average person. Normal. You know, those who are noble always believe they are normal. The minute you think that you are above others, that's the very moment that you are probably below them all. May Allah forgive us. Remember this. We need to ask Allah for goodness. But when you get the goodness, don't let it get to your head. Never. Never let it get to your head. If it does, that's your test. Fail. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us forgiveness. So he said something interesting. He says, three things I always ensure are clean. My tongue, my heart, and my wealth. I make sure they're clean. With my tongue, I never abuse. I never say anything. I constantly remember Allah. I use good words and I make sure that I don't hurt people with my tongue. With my heart, I make sure that I don't have malice and hatred for anyone. No jealousy for anyone. I make sure that I search and remove from it even the speck that is beginning to show. I take it out. My heart is clean. My tongue is clean. And my wealth, I make sure it is absolutely clean and pure. Never pinching, never stealing, never usurping, never deceiving, nothing at all. Whatever came, alhamdulillah, through hard work and sweat. So those are three things we learn. You want to be from paradise? I want to be from paradise. I promise you, if you were to look after these three, you would help yourself get there by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his mercy. So that is very interesting and a very, very powerful point. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu lived on for many years. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. He was actually uh, the name that comes to mind when, when we speak about Persia and the conquest of Qadisiyah and Nahawand, etc. He was also appointed as the uh, ambassador or the leader, the Amir of Kufa by Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. And at one point, he was even the head of Najd appointed by Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. Now, like I said earlier, he lived up to the age of 80. He passed away in Medina Munawwara. And there is a very interesting story that I will end with speaking about Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu. On his deathbed, his head was in the lap of his son. And his son was crying profusely. So he tells his son, don't cry, don't cry. You know, Allah has promised us Jannatul Firdaus. We've been told that by Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have hope in the mercy of Allah. My brothers and sisters, pause there for a moment. I want you to know that by the will of Allah, you will be in paradise. By the will and the mercy of Allah, you will be in paradise. And Allah will forgive us no matter what we've done. We need to keep trying. Never lose hope in the mercy of Allah. No matter who you are, no matter where you have been, no matter what you have done, Allah's mercy is greater than what you've done, no matter what it is. But you need to see Seek his forgiveness. That's the only thing. You need to keep trying. If you don't try, you will never achieve. But if you try, trust me, you will definitely get there. If I want to get, for example, to Manchester, I need to try. I need to speak to a few of you who's ready to take me to Manchester. And I'm sure 10, 20 people will be ready. But if I were not to speak, no one would even know. If I thought, no, Allah's great, he'll take me to Manchester. The world would just look at me and I feel like they must read in my eyes, Manchester. Subhanallah. Come on. 
That won't happen. The same applies to paradise. Try and you will get it. And if we look at this man, he tells his son, you know, my son, I participated in Badr. When I participated in Badr, I was wearing a specific clothing. I want you to bring that from the closet. And inshallah, when I pass away, I want you to bury me in that. So when I meet Allah, I will meet him. When I meet Allah, I will meet him with that which I had worn on the day of Badr because that was the biggest day ever. The battle of Badr took place when there were only 313 of them. And subhanallah, against all odds, they had actually succeeded. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. May we be from among those who can improve ourselves. There are so many interesting points that we have from this beautiful life of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu. I've only mentioned a few and my 30 minutes are up. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabina Muhammad wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.